For those of you who were here last night, what a message. You are in for a weekend of feasting on the Word of God. I never connected the story of Saul the way I did it last night with the times in which we are living. The theme that we have selected has focused on the great controversy. We are in a battle zone. It's easy for us sometimes to talk about things that, you know, are just pleasing to the ear. The prophet Isaiah talked about that. But God is calling us to be conscious of the times in which we're living. Jesus said, watch and pray. And I am so thankful for the messages that have been prepared in the heart of Pastor Sean Boonstra, the director and speaker for the Voice of, Minis Voice of Prophecy Ministry. He is our speaker for this final weekend of camp meeting. And for those of you who are not familiar with all the various ministries that Voice of Prophecy is involved with, it, uh, their flagship broadcast is called Disclosure. He and his wife, Jean, host that on current events and trends and how the Bible's perspective on today's issues are more relevant than ever. As was mentioned by Haskell and highlighted by the Pathways to Health ministry that we hope to uh, have initiated in the metropolitan areas across the Carolinas, it is our desire to create a climate of evangelism and discipleship because the only thing that we exist for as a church is to seek and to save the lost. And that is the prayer of my heart, that we will commit to praying like we have never prayed before, that God will lead people into a closer walk with Jesus. I thank Pastor Sean Boonstra for partnering with the Carolinas. Revelation Speaks Peace is a series that will be traveling around the globe and across the Carolinas and especially next year in the Raleigh metropolitan area. The Voice of Prophecy also has a number of resources to help our communities in their outreach and ministry efforts in where you can be a part of God's work as faithful witnesses for Him. Tonight, as Pastor Sean Boonster opens God's Word, I invite him to come up and we're going to ask a prayer of blessing upon him. And we're going to ask a prayer of blessing upon ourselves as we do each evening by calling on the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts. Join me in prayer. O oh God, our Father in heaven, the Sabbath hours are upon us. It is our day to come and rest in the Lord. It is our day to hope in the Lord. It is our day to find peace in the Lord. We know that we live in a battlefield, but Christ is the victor. Amen. Father, tonight I ask that you will embrace Pastor Sean Boonstra with your presence, that you will guide the words that he shares from your word, the message that he shares with your people, that our hearts will be moved and that our souls will be stirred into a closer walk with you that more than anything else, it'll, it will be our desire to be your faithful witnesses so that when we leave these campgrounds, everyone whose life we come in contact with will know that we have been with Jesus, that they will see Jesus radiating through our smiles and our very being, through the kindness that we radiate from our lives. May Jesus shine out of our hearts, Lord. For we pray this and we pray for the spirit of the living God to fall afresh on us. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh.
fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me and fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Amen. Thank you, Elder. Good evening and happy Sabbath to everybody. And it's good to see you. I, I think it was eight years ago that I was here last. and Eight years seems like such a short chunk of life suddenly. It goes by so quickly. And I think the last time I was here, my girls were little. One has left home now and the other one's about to. And that's not all bad. I've discovered that, you know, I, I, can, I can run around the house in my boxer shorts now and I can, I'm sizing up one of the bedrooms for a study. So it's not all bad. I think Gina's mourning more than I am. I love you kids. I know they're watching by streaming. I love you, but my job is to push you out of the nest. That's my job. Isn't that not a parent's job? You want your kids to prosper. I've told my kids, don't, don't you come home at 40. Don't you dare. <laughs> Well, they probably can. I'll be gone by then so they can have the house. Uh, we're doing some amazing things at the VOP, and I, I, I don't want to take time to talk about it. I'll just say this much. God has blessed this team for 25 years in public evangelism, and it's going stronger than it ever has. Crowds are bigger and more responsive today than they were 20 years ago. And I'm so convinced that the one thing we should be doing as a church is evangelism that I'm taking the voice of prophecy and we're franchising it. If you want to open the voice of prophecy in your church and have all the same evangelistic tools so that I can tell everybody in the world, go to my local office and you are that local office, we're setting that up. Go to discoverycenters.com. We're, or, we're opening up what's called Discovery Discovery Centers. Your church can be one, and I'll just send the audience straight to your church, and you'll have all the same tools I do when they arrive. How does that sound? All right. DiscoveryCenters.com. We've got to get this done. It's far, the time is over for five evangelists to run around doing all the work. Let's get it done. Let's go home. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but sometimes when you're studying the Bible, there'll be a story that kind of reaches out of the page and grabs you by the collar, and you can't let it go. It'll bother you. will try to move on to something else, but It'll be like a broken molar at the back of your mouth if you've ever had that experience. You try to go to work and pretend that thing's not broken, but your tongue is going to keep going back to that broken tooth all day long until you go to the dentist and fix it, or you to go to Walmart and get a nail file and file that thing down to smooth. And don't tell me you've never done that method. I've done that. The dentists in the room are cringing. I've filed my own teeth. It's It's cheaper. <laughs> I'm Adventist in Dutch. That's as cheap as people can get. So. <laughs> but some stories grab you, and for me that's true if it has last day overtones in it. I can't help but go back to it again. And for the last 15 years, there's one story that has bothered me and bothered me and bothered me, and it's the story of Jonah. It has poked at my conscience for a decade and a half to the point where I'm absolutely convinced there is something special there for God's last day people. There's no question in my mind. And there's no way, after contemplating it for 15 years, that I'm going to satisfy you with this topic in 45 minutes. But what I want to do is make it bother you so that you go and read that book and see what you find. There's something there for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask again that you would bless me tonight and that the words I speak would be honoring to Jesus. I don't have what it takes to come out and speak. Lord, it terrifies me, but you've told us to share what we know of Christ, and so I'm willing to do that tonight, but I'm asking that you first forgive my sins and make me fit, and that you would anoint me from heaven so that what I speak truly raises a monument to the honor of our Savior. And when you speak to our hearts tonight, we covenant with you that we will follow the Lamb wherever He goes, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Even though we're going to talk about Jonah tonight, I'm actually going to start reading in 2 Kings chapter 14. I hope you brought your Bibles tonight. And again, if you did not, 
uh, shame on you. Bring them again tomorrow morning. Get close to somebody. We're going to look at 2 Kings chapter 14, which is a passage that kind of ties into something we looked at last night. Now, if you weren't here last night or you don't remember what we talked about last night, don't feel too bad. I barely remember what I did an hour ago. But, but I'm going to review last night in six minutes flat. I will cover the whole thing again in six minutes, which will have some of you wondering, why didn't you do it in six minutes last night? We could have gotten to our cars before. Well, they gave me 45 minutes. And what does a preacher do when you give a preacher 45 minutes? You take 50. That's what you do. So if you're struggling, here's what we did last night. We looked at that awful story in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when the elders of Israel lose their confidence in God's absolute divine leadership, and they're starting to look at the Canaanite nations all around them and say, ooh, they're so sophisticated. We wish we could be like those Canaanites. We want a king just like them. And if you remember, they brought the idea to Samuel. Here's what we've noticed, Samuel. I mean, we don't know who's going to replace you when you're gone, but we've noticed all these sophisticated, grown-up countries all around us have a human king. They have a supreme ruler. They have a responsible, intelligent, highly educated, culturally sophisticated, paid professional running the whole show, and they seem to be doing just great. That's what we want. It was a tragedy, awful. It changed the whole course of world history, and that day was the beginning of a man-made tragedy that continues to this moment right now, what is it, June the 2nd, 2018. We're still living with the results of that one bad decision. We can't quite escape its gravitational pull. And that one bad decision paved the way for something the Bible calls the abomination of desolation. If you've ever studied prophecy, you can't help but hear that term, the abomination of desolation. It's actually the way that the original Old Testament ended. It was the final subject in the original Old Testament. And I know some people are thinking, but wait a minute, Sean, I have read the Old Testament. It ends with Malachi. And Malachi talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord. He talks about tithing. He talks about the return of Elijah. But there's nothing there about the abomination of desolation. And you're right, there isn't in Malachi. But here's a bit of a surprise, for, comes as a surprise to some people. Malachi was not originally the last book of the Old Testament. We reordered those books to suit our Western way of thinking. Nothing wrong with that. All the content's still there. But go sometime and grab an Old Testament, say, from the Jewish Publication Society. You're in for a surprise when you open that Old Testament. The books are in a different order to suit their way of thinking. They're grouped differently, and the last book of the Old Testament originally was Second Chronicles. That was the end of the story in the original Scriptures. And when you read the last few chapters of Second Chronicles, the original ending for the Old Testament, you discover the fallout from Saul. That's what's there. All the kings get more wicked with each generation. It says that Jehoiakim, with an M, did evil in the sight of the Lord and committed abominations, verse 8. Then it says Jehoiakim with an N did evil in the sight of the Lord in verse 9. Then it says Zedekiah did evil in the sight of the Lord in verse 12. And then it says because of all those abominations, Nebuchadnezzar came to town and sacked the temple. He burned it down and left it desolate. It's the abomination that caused desolation. That's the original sense of that term. Then when you get to the New Testament, you have Jesus weeping over Jerusalem in Matthew chapter 23. He said, how often have I sent the prophets to you? You wouldn't listen. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. It's the second abomination of desolation. The Romans come, burn down the temple. It's never been rebuilt. Then there's one more abomination of desolation when Daniel tells us that one day the apostate church will exalt itself against the prince of the host and cast down the place of his sanctuary, Daniel 8 and verse 11. Here's the thing I want to point out. In every case when there's an abomination of desolation in the Bible, it's not an outsider that caused it. It's the abominations of God's own people that caused it. Not some outside force. The Bible's not addressed to outsiders. It's addressed to us. Points out our sins. So then when you get to the book of Daniel, here's what you've got. Right? At the end, we have all these wicked kings, Nebuchadnezzar comes. Daniel kind of picks up that story a little bit, and all the wicked kings have come and gone, and now they live under Babylonian captivity, and the prophecy says they'll have Persian domination, followed by Greek domination, followed by Roman domination, followed by the little horn power. Then you jump over to Revelation 13, you find out one beast isn't bad enough, there's a second beast too. And it, it, it's basically this. This is human history playing out after we choose to reject the government of God. 
And that, that's the whole book of Daniel in one minute. It's as if God is saying, hey, come with me down to Macy's or Walgreens. Or, no, they don't sell clothes at Walgreens. I don't do the shopping in my house. Walmart. They sell clothes at Walmart. You come down there with me. You pick out all the outfits you want, all the human governments you want. You pick the prettiest ones, and you try them on and see how they fit. And when you finally realize that human government is not the answer to your problems, then Jesus will come and sit on his throne in glory. I will restore my kingdom. That's the book of Daniel in one minute. When I get to Raleigh, we'll spend 24 hours on it, but we can do it in one minute tonight. It's having us try on every human government. Now, that brief synopsis sets the table for what we're going to look at in Jonah tonight. And here's what's interesting about Jonah. The first place he shows up in the Bible is not the book of Jonah. And that's not first mentioned. It's actually in 2 Kings chapter 14. That's where we're going to go right now. So I hope you have your Bible. I'm pulling out my eyeglasses as you look that up. My eyes don't work like they did eight years ago either. In 2 Kings 14, we're actually in the northern kingdom of Israel. You know the story. The kingdom is split. This is about 700 years before Christ. And the, we, we're living under the reign of all these wicked kings. And because of that, the Assyrians are winning. They're beating God's people in the ten northern tribes. Here we go, 2 Kings 14, verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, now that's Jeroboam the second, there were two of them, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. That's pretty good in a day and age when a lot of people didn't live past 40. He reigned 41 years, verse 24, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. No surprise there, that's the pattern ever since Saul. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So at this point in the story, what we're seeing are the long-term problems that came from choosing a king and abandoning the government of God. We're getting exactly what God predicted, wicked kings. But now I want you to pay attention to what happens in verse 25 because it caught me by surprise, and it is absolutely not what you would expect in this story. 2 Kings 14, 25. He, that's Jeroboam, wicked king, he restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of the Arabah. What's the Sea of the Arabah? It's the Dead Sea. So what he did, here's what's going on. The territory had been shrinking under Assyrian pressure, but Jeroboam suddenly beats the Assyrians, and he grows the territory back, right? The entrance of Hamath is the northern limit of the ten tribes, the Dead Sea or the Sea of the Arabah. Is the, he grows it back. He seizes it back. He beats the Assyrians, what the Bible is telling me is that in spite of how wicked he is, in spite of the fact that he is following in the footsteps of Ahab, who was so wicked, he married a pagan queen, brought her right into Israel. Her name is Jezebel. She's so wicked, she shows up in the book of Revelation to describe how wicked things are going to get. He's that wicked, and somehow that wicked king still wins. He beats the Assyrians. He takes the country back. And what's remarkable to me is that this passage says, still in verse 25, the Bible says God allowed it to happen. It happened, it says, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel. Now let that sink in for a minute because that certainly doesn't jive with the way that I like to think. Wicked people are not supposed to do well. They're not supposed to prosper. At least that's the way I think. But in this story, God blesses a wicked king because sometimes under the rules of the great controversy, wicked people prosper. They just do. That's the way it is on this side of the second coming. And I'm guessing that Jeroboam, if he's like every other wicked person who's ever lived, is looking at the results thinking, ha ha, all those Israelites say, I'm a wicked king, but how wicked could I be? God is on my side. I won. God must approve of me. How else would you explain this? Well, you explain it this way. Sometimes God allows wicked people to prosper under the great controversy. And we still see it going on today, don't we? Still goes on today. Oh, I've been preaching the prosperity gospel for all my life, and I earned $80 million in the last three years. My book sales are off the charts. Obviously, God is on my side. No, he's not. No, he's not. If you're not preaching the cross of Christ, no, he's not. Sometimes God allows wickedness to prosper. That's the rules of the great controversy. Sean, you can't tell me I'm wrong. I belong to the biggest religious group on the face of the planet, more than a billion people. How wrong can we be? We're huge. You can be wrong. Sometimes wickedness prospers. That's just the way that it is. Oh, I, technically I break God's Ten Commandments once in a while. I know I worked on Sabbath one weekend, and, and I, I get that. But, but how wrong could I be? My bottom line's looking pretty good. God is blessing me. No, he's not. Sometimes he lets wicked people prosper. Don't fool yourself. Now, I don't like that rule. I don't like it at all, but it's true. Don't forget what David wrote, Psalm 73. Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. 
I have washed, cleansed my heart in vain. David's upset. I get upset too because sometimes wicked people prosper. And the Bible says Jeroboam restores the territory of Israel from Hamath to the Sea of the Arabah according, verse 25, to the word of the Lord God of Israel which he had spoken. Now listen to this. Here he comes. He had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from gath Hefer. That's the first time Jonah appears in the Bible. It's the only place outside of the book of Jonah that he's mentioned anywhere in the Old Testament. And it's quite a story. It's quite, we don't often come across this story. It's quite a story. What it describes is a very unusual assignment. God approaches jo- Jonah. Lord, is that you? Is that really? Yes, it is. I need you to do something very special for me, Jonah. Well, Lord, you tell me whatever it is. I will do it. I mean, a call from God. Can you believe this? I, let me get a pen and a piece of parchment. I want to write this all down. I want to get it. No, it's really pretty simple. Jonah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the children of Israel and tell them I'm going to give them back all that land in spite of their wickedness, in spite of Jeroboam. I'm giving it all back, and I'll help them defeat the Assyrians. Now, i got to tell you, if you're going to be a prophet, that's the assignment you want. That's a pretty good assignment. That's better than Hosea's assignment, amen? Go marry a woman of ill repute. She's going to cheat on you. You're going to have to buy her back at auction. That's not a good assignment. (laughs) Jeremiah, you're going to have to tell the elders in Israel. You're going to have to tell the priests that Nebuchadnezzar is going to burn the city. That's not good. Jonah gets a great assignment. That's good news. This would be like God sending you down to the American Congress. You go stand there in the Congress, I'll give you an hour on the platform, and you tell them you can do what you want, America, and God will prosper you anyway. You go ahead, throw out your original Protestant Republican principles, you ignore religious tolerance, you clamp down on free speech, you undermine the God-given Constitution, you do whatever you want, and I'll still bless you. That would be an easy assignment. But you have to bear in mind why God prospers them at this moment. He can't stand the suffering, verse 26. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter, and whether bond or free, there was no helper for Israel. If God didn't intervene, they're going to be wiped out. And if they're wiped out, and then the south is wiped out, the plan of salvation is at risk. The great controversy comes to a premature close, so God intervenes. He intervenes. It says in verse 27, And the Lord did not say that He would blot out the name of Israel from under heaven. There's a limit to God's discipline. We all get disciplined by God once in a while, but there's a limit to it. Because because the idea behind God disciplining you, He's not trying to wipe you out. He's not trying to keep you out of the kingdom. He wants you there. That's what the discipline comes from. He didn't give His Son's life to lose you. Discipline's to get you in, not to keep you out. So there's a line in the sand. Jeroboam gets used in spite of himself. God uses a wicked king. A wicked king is the servant of God. And that tells me something about how you and I probably, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, should relate to political leadership today. Bear with me for a minute. I'm not going to get terribly political because we've been counseled not to do that. But there's counsel here for God's people. I don't know if you've noticed. I don't know if you've noticed, but we live in one of the most politically contentious moments in America history. Maybe you've caught wind of it. And we're all tempted, right, to say, this politician is of the devil. That politician is Satan incarnate. And I promise as I'm saying that, you had somebody pop into your head. You thought of somebody. (laughs) But if we take the Bible seriously, then you've got to admit, God will use whoever he wants, and you can't write anybody off. You can't do it. We need to be very careful how we speak about human leadership in public as a church. I mean, in your home, have your opinion. That's fine. I'm sure we have people of various opinions here. That's fine. But as a people, as a church, we must be very careful how we speak about human leadership because we have no idea how God's going to play it. We don't know. And we need, as a church, to drop the subject of politics and get back to the one thing God asked us to do. Because it doesn't matter who this world elects. It doesn't matter. Loud cry is still going to come. Jesus is still... God is not waiting for the right election to take place. God is not waiting for the right people to sit in Congress. God is not waiting for the right monarch to be in Europe. That's not what he's waiting for. He's not waiting for us to pass the right piece of legislation so that Jesus can come. That is not what God is waiting for. Right now, he's only waiting for one thing. He's waiting for his people to do the one thing that he asked them to do. That's what he's waiting for. And when we've done that, then Jesus comes. It doesn't depend on government. God's got it under control. Here's a quote, great controversy. I think it's from page 610. Here we go. 
So long as Jesus remains man intercessor in the sanctuary above, the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit is felt by rulers and people. It still controls to some extent the laws of the land. Leave that part to God. He's got it under control. Were it not for these laws, the condition of the world would be much worse than it now is, if you can imagine that. Well, many of our rulers are active agents of Satan. Don't you dare think of an individual. God also has his agents among the leading men of the nation. And you don't know who they are. If you guess, you're going to be wrong. Jeroboam was one of them. The only issue we should be worried about, counsel tells us, is our freedom to proclaim the message, religious liberty. That's it. She continues, the enemy moves upon his servants to propose measures that would impede the work of God. But statesmen who fear the Lord are influenced by holy angels to oppose such propositions with unanswerable arguments. God's got it under control. The world doesn't need more political opinions. It's got lots of those. That's not what it needs from God's last day remnant people. What it needs from God's last day remnant people is the truth. That's what it needs. It needs to learn about Jesus. The world will light up with the everlasting. And as we do that, we should probably understand as God's people. As we head out into the world to fulfill that one thing he asked us to do, we should probably understand that our assignment is more like Jonah's second assignment than his first. Now we're going to slow down a little bit. They actually put up a clock tonight. It wasn't there yesterday. Are you trying to tell me something? Or... If I ran one minute late tonight, would you forgive me? The Bible, say, yeah, the Bible says you can't go to heaven if you don't. So they didn't... But I want to slow down a little bit. You know I don't have a slow setting, so we're going to go as slow as I know how. But we're going to look at the book of Jonah now, and we're going to look for something specific. I am convinced that our movement is in that book. It's there. I've spent 15 years looking for it. That book's not just there so we can wag a finger at an unfaithful prophet who lived 2,700 years ago. Uh -uh. Paul says these things were written for our learning, Romans chapter 15. So you're supposed to be able to find you in that book. If you're ever going to the Bible to find somebody else, you've got the wrong approach. You need to be going there to find you. But I also want to look at us. So are you ready to take a look at the book of Jonah? Two people. You're not so sure what's coming next. Buckle your seatbelts. Jonah 1, verse 1. Jonah 1 and verse 1. Now the Lord, word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. That means freedom. That's ironic, isn't it? There's nobody less free than Jonah by the end of this book. Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. I've heard skeptics make fun of that. Nineveh, a great city, maybe soaking wet. It had 120,000 people, a great city. It's not talking about its population. It's talking about its attitude, its arrogance. It was the Babylon of its day. As a matter of fact, it was so powerful, so successful, Nineveh, that the historical lines between Babylon and Nineveh have been blurred. Some stories were not sure which city they took place in. There's even a small chance, I don't believe it, but there's a small chance that the Hanging Gardens were actually in Nineveh and not in Babylon. It's just that closely related. It was the big city of its day. And she's arrogant and she's proud. She's just like Babylon would be later. The great city, cry out. That's the same assignment we have. We're supposed to go call people out of Babylon. Go preach to the great city. So God comes to Jonah again. Hey, Jonah, Lord, is that you again? Yes, Jonah, it's me. Do you remember that time I sent you to see Jeroboam? Yeah, that was excellent. That was so much fun. I thought I was going to go into farming and take over the family farm, but I like religion better. I want to be a prophet. Well, if you like that, Jonah, have I got an assignment for you? Oh, that's good. Let me go get my eye slab. It's the latest thing from Apple. I want to write this all down. I want to write this down. Now, Lord, you tell me. It's really simple. I don't think you need to write this down, Jonah. I want you to go to Nineveh. Go to Nazareth. Did you say Nazareth or did you say Nineveh? Because for a minute there I thought you said Nineveh. Yeah, I did say Nineveh, Jonah. I want you to go visit the Assyrians. I have to say, Lord, I can't go see the Assyrians. Have you seen those people? They hate us, Jonah. I think you'll find it by the time you... No, Lord, have you seen what they do to people? I've seen the murals they leave on the cliffs. They cut off your nose. They cut off your ears, their hands and their feet. Then they take what's left of you and they impale it on a stake and they let you live for days that way. Then they skin you while you're still alive and they hang the skins on the walls of the city to scare their enemies. And I got to tell you something, Lord, it works. I'm scared. I mean, you wouldn't want to go to Nineveh either. You really wouldn't. They were the most violent, bloodthirsty people on the face of the planet. They worshiped Ishtar also from Babylon. But their version of Ishtar was like this. She fell in love with Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was a mighty and arrogant hunter who founded the cities of the plain. He was their name for Nimrod. 
And Ishtar falls in love with, ooh, I like a guy like that. She falls in love with Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh doesn't think much of her and spurns her. She gets so mad she becomes a sadistic goddess of war. Oh, the Assyrians loved her. The more violent and merciful we can be, the more we honor Ishtar. I'd be scared to go too. Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Lord, you know I love you. You know I want to cooperate with you, but this isn't reasonable. I know it's not reasonable, Jonah. That's why this will be fun. Nothing I've ever asked for has ever been reasonable. Cross the Red Sea is not reasonable. Take Jericho without touching it. That's not reasonable. Abraham, put your son on the altar. That's not, it's never been reasonable, and that's on purpose, Jonah, because I want you to understand when this is over, you didn't do this, I did. Of course it's unreasonable. I'm trying to teach you to trust me again. You guys threw away trust in the Garden of Eden, and I want you to understand that you can trust me, so of course it's unreasonable. If it was easy, it wouldn't even be fun. Lord, you can't expect me to go to Nineveh. You have no idea what they're like. Oh, really, Jonah, you think I don't know what they're like? And I don't know what the post-moderns and the millennials and all the seculars... I don't know, I don't know what it's like. No, I do know what they're like, and I know what you're like, so that's why I made this match. I think there's nobody better for the job. But there's all these cultural barriers, Lord. It's not just Ishtar. They have hundreds of gods. If it was one god, we could compare notes. We each have one god. But they, got, they even worship a fish god named Dagon. Hey, Jonah, call it a hunch. But I think by the time you get to Nineveh, they're going to respect your opinion on fish. Just say. <laughs> Jonah, I need you. Those are my people. Israel was supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They didn't did, do it. They became like the Gentiles, and I love those people, and I need you to go, verse 3. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare. Went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. God asked him to go up to Nineveh. He goes down. Down to Joppa, down to the bottom of the ship, way down in his relationship with God. So you've got to wonder, what's the message for God's people? Here's a good question. Why do the Jews to this day read the book of Jonah on the Day of Atonement? Why? It's because the more you study it, the more you'll become convinced that this is actually not just the story of Jonah, but also a, a veiled prophecy of God's last day remnant church. If you've never seen this before, just ask yourself one question, one question to start your inquiry. How in the world did Jonah think he was going to flee from the presence of the Lord? Guys, bring up my map for just a minute. Let's have that map on the screen. I don't know if you can read this, but I'll, I'll limp over here. I hurt my leg this morning, last night. There, over, I don't have a laser pointer, so you're going to have to, the bottom dot is Gath Hefer. That's where Jonah comes from. Way up there on the right is Nineveh, and that's near modern-day Mosul in Iraq. And over here in Spain is Tarshish, way over on the way. It's a long ways away. It's as far, this was his whole world. And, and Tarshish is as far away as you could get from where you're supposed to go. It was the complete opposite of where he was supposed to go. But is that far enough away to get away from God? I mean, can you escape God in Spain? No, the Portuguese think so. But in reality, no. And now, I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I would suggest that this boat is probably run by Phoenician sailors because they were legendary, and they knew the routes that took you to the furthest parts of the world, and we know for sure that Tarshish was a Phoenician trading post. These people knew all the secret places of the earth. There's actually a good chance that they're the ancient ancestors of the Celts because we're starting to believe that the Celts started in the southern tip of Portugal and spread out across Europe from there. The Phoenicians knew ever. There's even a rumor, I don't know if it's true or not, rumor that they made it here to the Americas because we're starting to find some stuff around this continent that looks awfully Phoenician here, there, and everywhere. I don't know if that was really them or not, but they knew the secret places of the earth, and if you wanted to run away to the furthest point you could go, you would get some Phoenicians. And in the original language, when it says that he paid the fare for the boat, if you go and read the old Hebrew Midrash, it actually says he paid the fare for the whole thing. He chartered the whole boat. He didn't just ride it like a Greyhound bus, one of 100 passengers. This wasn't a Southwest flight. The language suggested that he chartered the whole thing. So there's no chance of somebody showing up and talking him back into going to Nineveh. I'll get the whole boat. Now, if that's true, you've got to wonder, how does a humble farmer prophet from gath Hefer pay for a whole Phoenician ship? How do you do? I mean, they were expensive. It would be like renting a Princess Cruise Line ship for yourself. You'd run out of money in the first 30 minutes. That's what would happen. So did he cash in everything, sell the family's land, sell the family's inheritance so he could afford that ship? 
What would we do to run away from God? I mean, I wonder sometimes, how many times have I actually expended more energy avoiding God's call than it would have taken to obey in the first place? He bought the whole boat to go as far as he could, except you know you can't get away from God in Tarshish. Whither shall I go from your spirit? Psalm 139. Where shall I flee from your... You can't run away from God. So why does it say that he fled from the presence of the Lord? Because that's what it says. It doesn't say he ran away. It says it twice. He left the presence of the Lord. Now, here's where it's going to get a little bit technical, but I want you to stick with me because this is going to pay off. Here's where our movement shows up. How many of you have ever heard of the Bible study rule of first mention? Anybody ever heard of the rule of first? Some of you. First time something shows up in the Bible, pay attention. It'll help you understand it everywhere else. First time a lamb shows up in the Bible, it's Isaac asking, where is the lamb, Father? It helps us understand who the Lamb of God is. And curiously enough, the first time John brings up a lamb in his gospel, he answers Isaac's question. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. First mention. The first time something shows up in the Bible, pay careful, careful attention because it's going to teach you how to understand that. So what does it mean to leave the presence of the Lord? Well, that actually does show up somewhere earlier in the Bible, and it shows up in Genesis chapter 4. Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land. Now, Cain didn't know of some secret spot where God couldn't find him. That's not what that means. What does it mean? This is where you might want to buckle your seatbelt for a minute because this has big implications. This is the detail that has arrested my attention for 15 years. It's rocked my world, and we're out of time. (laughs) Buckle your seatbelts. You go back a few verses to Genesis chapter 3. He, God, drove out the man and placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Cherubim are the angels that stand next to the throne of God, right? God told Moses, I will speak to you from between the cherubim. Nine times the Old Testament describes God as the one who dwells between the cherubim. This is the language of the presence of God. There are two cherubim and a fiery flaming sword between them. And fire in the Bible is always an indication of the presence of God. Always. Moses of the burning bush, the disciples with tongues of fire on their head, Mount Sinai burning when God descends. This is the language of the presence of God. And when it says that the Lord placed cherubim there, the original word in Hebrew is shakin. It's the root word for shekinah. And it literally means tabernacled. It literally says God tabernacled at the gates of Eden with the two cherubim. The presence of God was literally there. So Cain could literally leave it. Here's how Ellen White describes it, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 84. At the cherubim-guarded gate of paradise, the glory of God was revealed, and hither came the first worshipers. It's literally the, the first sanctuary. The very first sanctuary service, that's how Cain can literally leave the presence of God. And it turns out that's exactly what Job was try- uh, sorry, Jonah was trying to do. See, back in Jonah's day, if you go and read some of the better commentaries from the 19th century, I made a remarkable discovery. Jonah, 700 years before Christ, the culture of his day believed that the gift of prophecy worked because of your proximity to the temple. God's presence was there, and if you were nearby, the gift of prophecy would work. But if you stepped over the national boundary, it would stop working. So why is he leaving the country? He's trying to shut off the spirit of prophecy. That's what he's trying to do. It's like going out of range with your cell phone. He wants no more bars of signal. He's too close to the presence of God. Here's what Jonah's running away from, and listen to me carefully. Jonah is running away from the temple because he believes the temple is the source of his prophetic gift, and that's really obvious in chapter 2. When he comes back and repents, he says, I've been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. That's how he repents. He's running away from two things, folks, the sanctuary and the spirit of prophecy. Since the birth of this Seventh-day Adventist movement, every time we have an internal doctrinal crisis, what two things always bubble to the surface? Every single time. Suddenly, the history of our movement makes great sense. Fellas, bring up the picture of D.M. Canwright. We're going to take a little walk through a rogues gallery for just a minute, and I want you to think about this. One of the most famous names in Seventh-day Adventist apostasy had an appetite for popularity. He literally told someone one day, I could be so famous if it wasn't for this message. I'd be a great man. Then he resigns for the last time in 1887, and he tells the brethren, I don't believe in the law or the Sabbath, but I really don't believe in the sanctuary or the testimonies because it's always one or both 
of those. John Harvey Kellogg, Battle Creek, Michigan, wrote a book called The Living Temple, took God out of the heavenly sanctuary. He taught pantheism. He put God anywhere but the heavenly sanctuary because those two things always show up, the sanctuary and or the spirit of prophecy. Albion Ballinger, the holy flesh movement, predictably challenged the doctrine of the sanctuary. He said, Jesus went straight to the most. Have we still got Kellogg on the screen. We're ready for Ballinger. Give me some Ballinger. There he is. Holy flesh movement. He said Jesus didn't, he went straight to the most holy place. There's no heavenly sanctuary. When Ellen White tried to correct him, he attacked the spirit of prophecy because it's always those two things every single time, about every 30 years. Pay attention to what's going on. I don't have a picture of Conradi, but the same thing again. Sanctuary and the spirit of prophecy. Let's talk about our own generation. Ronald Numbers, 1976. He said Ellen White didn't hear from God. She stole her ideas from 19th century health reformers because it's always the sanctuary and or the spirit of prophecy. Des Ford, 1980 said there's no investigative judgment. He stole an idea from Ballinger. Jesus went straight to the most holy place because it's always, always, always the sanctuary and or the spirit of prophecy. Walter Ray, 1983. Said Ellen White didn't get those ideas from God. She plagiarized. Even though, even though Ellen White told everybody to go out and buy the book, she supposedly plagiarized. That's not a good plagiarist at all. She literally said, everybody should have these books in their library. Why, why would a plagiarist advertise the books that she'd been reading and supposedly? It's nonsense. It's always the sanctuary and or the spirit every single time. Because if those two things disappear, the Seventh-day Adventist church goes out of business. It's gone. Amen. It's gone. So it can't be a coincidence when that suddenly shows up in the book of Jonah. It's a message to God's last day church. And just in case you have any lingering doubt, listen to the words that Jonah utters when the heathen sailors are terrified, they're begging for mercy, and they come to Jonah and ask him, why aren't you praying? Who do you worship? Listen to his words. Jonah 1 verse 9, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Sound familiar? Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heaven, the sea, and the springs of waters. First thing out of his mouth when the crisis is on, is something that sounds an awful lot like the first angel's message. Jonah preaches it, but you notice he only does it when they force him. And that's the tragedy. They're begging him, what do you believe? Who do you worship? Is that the message for us? Is that what we're supposed to see? Jonah 1 verse 4, the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. That's prophetic language. Wind on, oh, if we had another hour to unpack that, wind blowing on the sea, the Gentile nations coming up, four angels holding back the winds. The Lord sent out a great wind on the sea. There was a mighty tempest. Sometimes we get storms in our life because the devil's trying to wipe us out. Happens to me all the time. If you work for Jesus, don't expect easy street. The devil will kick up a fuss. It's okay. He's finished. You know, let him kick up his fuss. It's a temper tantrum. Sometimes it's him, like with Job. But there are other times, we can't deny what the text says, that sometimes God sends the storm to wake his people up. Because he wants the world to get concerned enough that maybe they'll come and shake us awake and ask us, what we, is that what we're supposed to see? Verse 5, the mariners were afraid. Every man cried out to his God. Now the heathen are praying. Just like your neighbors are praying. They don't know who they're praying to, some of them. But they see what's going on in this world. They see the Middle East. They see what's going on in North Korea. They see all that stuff. They see the terrorist attacks, and they're terrified. They're crying out for something. But Jonah, it said, had gone down to the lowest parts of the ship, had laid down, and was fast asleep. Is that what we're supposed to see? How could Jonah be so much like Jesus, asleep in the boat during the storm, and so much not like Jesus all at the same time? Is that it? I'll tell you something. The world around us is panicking because they know it's not business as usual. They're more ready to admit it than we are sometimes. They're trying to find answers. They're passing laws. They're calling elections. They're debating resolutions. And somehow we've managed to convince ourselves that they don't want to listen to what we have and that evangelism doesn't work. I hear it all the time. It doesn't work. The world's not interested in what we have to say. And I know that because I saw a study that proves it, Sean. But I'll tell you this tonight, the only way you can come to the conclusion that the world doesn't want what this movement has to offer is to never go out and meet those people and share what we have to offer because I am telling you, crowds are bigger than they ever have been and they're more responsive than they ever have been. We're just not going out there and meeting them. God did not give us the impossible assignment. 
He did not miss the final generation. He didn't. You know, you think God is caught by surprise. Oh, my goodness, I didn't see the millennials coming, and I gave them the three angels' messages. I gave them the wrong message. You think that's how God operates? It's exactly the right message, and it's still working. Crowds are, is that the message in the book of Jonah? So the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Why do we struggle to believe that God has asked us to do the impossible? Why do we struggle to believe that God actually gets to a community before you do? Every single time. There's no such thing in this world as a cold interest. Anybody you talk to, God got to him first. Certainly true in the story of Jonah. Here's what we know about Nineveh. Before Jonah showed up, they had a huge earthquake, and they were wondering why. We also know they suffered a humiliating defeat on the battlefield, and they're wondering if their gods had abandoned them. They'd also had a, a plague fall on the city. We don't know what disease it was, but it killed a bunch of people. And they're panicking. They're wondering what's going on. They're like the Ethiopian eunuch. They're halfway through the book of Isaiah by the time Jonah shows up covered with seaweed. God always gets there. We're too afraid of this. Jonah 3, verse 5, So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then the word came to the king of Nineveh. He arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth. Even the king of Nineveh will respond to the call of Christ. We are too afraid of this assignment. I'll tell you what bothers me most about this story. Really bothers me. It doesn't have an ending. It doesn't. A bitter prophet under a dead tree, that's it. No ending. Just tells us about a guy that God pushed out of his comfort zone, sent him into the big wide world, and he hates evangelism. And that's the end of the story. It just ends. That bothers me. But maybe what bothers me more is that at the end of the book, the heathen are in better shape than Jonah. Phoenician sailors are more awake. They're certainly more dedicated to prayer. The Assyrians heard that the hour of God's judgment had come, and the whole city repented, even the king. There's only one person who's not right with God at the end of that story. The remnant church. The prophet. And that's the way it leaves it. It makes me wonder. Does God really need me to reach people? No, He doesn't. He's got better qualified angels by far. Doesn't need my talents, your talents. So maybe he's not asking us because he needs us. Maybe he's asking us because we need it. It's how you learn to believe. And maybe we need an opportunity to get right with God. Maybe the only way we'll see the selfish darkness that still lingers in our heart is when we get out there and meet those people, the people we wrote off as hopeless heathens, and we discover that they're actually closer to the kingdom than we are. Maybe we need it. Maybe the story doesn't have an ending because we're supposed to write it. Two guys I know of, true story, became friends in college. They were amazed as they got to know each other just how much they had in common. I mean, they loved the same stuff, loved the same cars, had the same opinion about politics, the same opinion about philosophy, same opinion about religion, not a good opinion about religion at that point in their lives, and even the same taste in girls. They liked all the same stuff. And If you'd ever met these two boys or listened into the conversations they used to have as they sat around late on a Saturday night debating the big issues of the world, you wouldn't have given them a chance to become a part of the kingdom of God because they were hopeless heathens. They're Ninevites. They're as lost as you can get. Pagans, hedonists. But then suddenly, inexplicably, one of those boys suddenly has an unexpected meeting with Jesus, and through a number of miraculous circumstances, he discovers the book of Revelation of all things. He discovers the three angels' messages, and it was such a breathtaking picture of Jesus, he couldn't deny it anymore. He had no choice left but to repent of his sins and become a part of God's remnant church. No choice. I happen to know it's a true story. I know it. In the back of his mind, that young man always thought, I should tell my friend what I discovered because this message, the three angels' messages, it actually answers all the questions we used to ask at 2 o'clock in the morning as we sat there drinking beer and, and, and debating life. I need to tell him. But he couldn't work up the courage to do it. He would, he would think about it, and then he would chicken out every time. And a week went by, and a month went by, and a year went by, and then he found out. His friend had been out drinking on a Saturday night like they both used to do. As he went down the highway, his car crossed the center line, and 
into oncoming traffic. He was so badly burned they were going to have to have the casket closed. Now the young man found some courage. He went over to his friend's parents' house. He was an only child. He went there to cry with them. And his heart broken too, and the father tried to ask him to be a pallbearer but couldn't utter the words, do you think you could? And he just starts sobbing. Ripped the other young man up because now one of those boys is at home in God's remnant church and the other one is dead. It's too late. And even though it happened almost 26 years ago, there's not a day I don't think about him. I wish I'd said something before he died. He would have loved this church. I'll never let that happen again. Not a chance. And so even though getting up here and preaching scares the stuffing out of me, I'm terrified of this, folks. It, I shake in my boots. I throw up before I preach all the time. But I'm never going to let that happen again. How can we be silent when the world's throwing their cargo overboard? How? All of us want to escape an ordinary life, don't you? You don't want a boring life. You don't want to just punch the clock until you die. So imagine finding out there's actually a cosmic war going on in the universe. The forces of darkness are controlling this planet, and you've been given an unequaled opportunity to claw back some territory stolen by a fallen angel. That means something. To push back against the darkness with your life, that means something. And imagine when Jesus comes just a heartbeat from now that he smiles, he places a crown on your head, he speaks your name in front of the whole universe, and at that moment you will realize you have learned what he wanted you to learn. That's why the story of Jonah doesn't have an ending. Because it hasn't been written yet. And you need to write it. I'm going to ask Christine Woolman, our singer at the VOP, to come out and sing for us at this moment. And I'm going to come back with a challenge for you. Listen to this. There is a candle in every soul, some brightly burning, some dark. Deceived and torn 
I, I have a challenge for you. I'm not going to say that stuff and not ask you to do something about it. I've been running scared for 25 years doing public evangelism. It always feels like my hair's on fire and it scares me, but it works. And maybe you don't know exactly what you would do, but tonight you're going to say, you know what, I'll help write the end of that book. I'll share Jesus with somebody. It's God tapping you on the shoulder and saying, you know what, why don't you give Nineveh a try? It's more fun than you think. If he's speaking to your heart, would you stand with me for closing prayer? F Father in heaven, we sometimes don't know what to say and create some anxiety and some fear in our hearts, but with our hearts beating wildly in our chests, we'll go. Give us somebody to share Jesus with this week. Make it obvious that that is a divine appointment and that you have set it up. And we'll be faithful. A little scared, but faithful. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. We want to go home. We'll finish the work, and you can come. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if they have a closing announcement or not. No? Yes? You can go. Thank you for being here this evening.